Okay, everyone. My name is Trevor Anderson, and for my project, I'm covering construction violation. Um, I don't think any of us anticipated giving our lectures this way, but um, here we are. Um, I am in my home office. It is probably about midnight. Um, I live in a house with five cats and two young children, and so I kind of do my things at night when everyone's asleep. Um, but nevertheless, here we go. So first off, I want to cover um, just kind of generally what your body's going to do uh, when you have basal constriction. So when you need to constrict, your body's going to produce um, angiotensin. And this is a figure we've seen in class, so we should all be fairly familiar. Um, eventually through a certain, um, the RAS pathway, we're going to produce angiotensin 2. That angiotensin 2 is going to bind angiotensin receptor on the surface of your smooth muscle cells. Uh, it might be kind of hard to see on the screen there, but here is that receptor. Uh, it's G-alpha-Q receptor, and so we know that G-alpha-Q receptors, um, it's going to activate phospholipase C, which is going to facilitate uh, that reaction um, where PIP's going to you know, convert to DAG and IP3. That IP3 is going to cause this calcium influx into the cell. So here we see the calcium is flowing into the cell. Um, that calcium is actually going to associate with the calmodulin. And that's what we're seeing right here. The calcium and the calmodulin are coming together and associating. These two together are going to phosphorylate myosin light chain kinase. Um, then that myosin light chain kinase is going to phosphorylate the myosin light chain, uh, which we see right here. It's going to phosphorylate it. Uh, that phosphorylation is eventually going to cause um, uh, that vasoconstriction. Switching gears just a little bit, uh, I want to go on to vasodilation. So when you have constricted those blood vessels, you made them much smaller. Uh, so now we're at a point where we need them bigger. We need to dilate them. So the way we do that is our endothelial cells are going to send what are called endothelial re relaxing factors to the smooth muscle cell. Um, one of those is going to be um, adenosine. Um, adenosine has a receptor on the smooth muscle cell. Um, this actually is a G-alpha S receptor. So you know it's going to increase CAMP, it's going to activate PKA. Um, now what happens when it activates PKA is PKA is, actually has the ability to put a phosphate on myosin light chain kinase. Uh, if you remember what I just said earlier, calmodulin and calcium also uh, put a phosphate on myosin light chain kinase. Uh, but PKA is going to put that phosphate in a spot that is actually going to cause it to no longer be able to bind to that calcium calmodulin. Uh, so that calmodulin calcium association is not going to be able to phosphorylate it at a spot that's going to allow it to continue that chain. Uh, so eventually that's also going to cause that dilation because you're cutting off that pathway. Um, another thing that's going to happen is if you notice these endothelial cells are producing nitric oxide. Once that nitric oxide gets into the smooth muscle cell, what it's going to do is it's going to activate a guanylate cyclase. Uh, what that guanylate cyclase does is it actually facilitates the production of cyclic GMP. Um, and what happens then is that cyclic GMP is going to shut off um, the calcium intake into the cell. Uh, so you're going to reduce the amount of calcium you're bringing into the cell, as well as reducing uh, that calcium's ability uh, or that calcium calmodulin association's ability to phosphorylate that myosin light chain. All this together, um, I hope it hasn't gotten too convoluted, is going to result in vasodilation. This is another figure that kind of reiterates what I've already said, but it also notes some important things to kind of separate out in your mind. Um, here's your endothelial cell. Here's your smooth muscle cell. Um, now, when you have a calcium influx into your smooth muscle cell, we're going to get vasocontraction. We saw that in the first slide. Uh, the binding of the angiotensin uh, eventually produces IP3, which causes that influx and get constriction. Um, but actually in the endothelial cells, which remember the ones that produce those releasing factors, um, it's exactly the opposite. It's inverse. Um, calcium influxes into these endothelial cells activate a protein called NOS. 
That NOS protein is actually the one that facilitates the production of nitric oxide. Um, so that influx in calcium is going to activate this um, enzyme here, which is going to increase the amount of nitric oxide you have in this cell. That nitric oxide is going to travel to your smooth muscle cells. It's going to activate that guanylate cyclase, produce cyclic GMP, and cause vasodilation. Uh, this part down here is exactly what we saw in the previous slide. Um, I just kind of wanted to separate that a calcium influx in your smooth muscle cell is going to cause uh, constriction, but actually a calcium influx into your endothelial cells is going to produce more releasing factor, which is going to eventually cause uh, dilation in your smooth muscle cells. A few interesting things to note. Um, is that hemoglobin, when oxygenated, has a really good ability of picking up that nitric oxide uh, that's being that you know is being produced by um, those endothelial cells. Um, under main under normal conditions, your endothelial cells um, are gonna you know tell your body, hey, it's fine. We don't need to uh, dilate as much. We don't have a need to really get stuff everywhere so we can constrict a, a little bit. Um, but one of the ways it's able to do that is when it's producing nitric oxide, the oxygenated hemoglobin actually can come by and pick that up, which is gonna keep it from ever getting to your smooth muscle cells. Um, but deoxygenated hemoglobin doesn't have um, the ability to pick up that nitric oxide. Uh, so what this means for you is that if you're ever in the woods and you find yourself running from a bear, which is not recommended, but nevertheless, if that's where you find yourself, um, when you're running, your hemoglobin is going to be less oxygenated, of course, because you're really using that oxygen. You've got to get it around, but you can't, you know, obviously breathe fast enough to get as much as you need. Um, this is kind of where we see lactic acid formation, formation and things like that. But in this case, that deoxygenated hemoglobin, which you're going to have more of if you're running from a bear, is going to uh, leave more nitric oxide. And that nitric oxide is gonna cause more dilation because now you're not taking it away. It's gonna cause more dilation, which is gonna allow more blood circulation, which is gonna allow you to get more oxygen to the places where you need it. Um, so that's an interesting way, uh, you know, kind of a real life example of where nitric oxide is gonna help you out a little bit. Another interesting tidbit is actually coffee and nitric oxide. I myself am a huge coffee addict. Uh, sweet cream cold brews from Starbucks are everything to me, um, which I can't get right now because I'm in quarantine, but I'm trying to make it. Uh, this is the same figure that we saw before, um, so I'm not going to spend much time explaining it. But over here we see that the more coffee that you drink, when you're drinking that coffee, um, the, the uh, caffeine in that coffee is actually going to cause that um, calcium influx into your endothelial cells, um, specifically endothelial cells. And remember, like I said before, an influx in endothelial cells causes an increase in NOS, which causes an increase in nitric oxide, which is one of those endothelial relaxing factors. So overall, the more coffee you drink, the more vasodilation you're going to have. And less stress, too, but that's aside from the point. Um, I wanted to cover some common disorders with constriction and dilation. Um, lupus um, is a common disorder that's usually characterized by some sort of hypertension. Um, and what that's caused by is actually a decrease in your endothelial relaxing factor, nitric oxide. Uh, your endothelial cells aren't going to produce as much nitric oxide. Um, which in turn is going to cause more vasoconstriction because you're not cutting off um, that calcium influx and that um, uh, inhibitory phosphate on mice and lactin kinase. Uh, one drug they use to treat this is atorvastatin. Um, atorvastatin is going to work by activating that nitric oxide um, cyclic GMP pathway. Um, so the pathway that actually uses nitric oxide to produce cyclic GMP is going to be activated by atorvastatin, which means you're going to have more cyclic GMP and um, less constriction, more dilation. Um, another one is pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, this occurs in pretty much the same way that uh, hypertension and lupus occurs. 
you have a reduction in your endothelial relaxing factor, nitric oxide, uh, which increases uh, vasoconstriction, uh, causing hypertension. Um, a drug that they use for this is methyl dopa. Methyl dopa is a renin inhibitor. And if you remember that RAS pathway that I mentioned a few times, renin is the first enzyme in there that's going to convert angiotensin to angiotensin 1. Um, I'll cover more on this later. Um, but methyl dopa is the first choice for specifically pregnancy-induced hypertension because it doesn't have too many adverse effects on the fetus. A couple more disorders. These aren't much disorders as they are um, lifestyle-type issues. Um, stress. Stress increases the response from your sympathetic nervous system. Um, and what that actually does is it increases the activation of your RAS pathway. Um, your RAS pathway is the one that, you know, angiotensin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. Um, so overall, activation of that pathway increases your concentration of angiotensin 2, um, which, of course, we have already covered what that does. It's going to, in turn, increase your vasoconstriction and cause hypertension. Um, smoking is a really interesting um, idea here because it, it, it causes um, hypertension in a different way. Um, when you smoke a cigarette, the actual smoke that you're inhaling has nitric oxide in it. Um, that nitric oxide um, is going to um, allow the blood vessels of your respiratory system to dilate, which is actually going to cause more blood to flow through there. Um, and it's going to allow you to take up as much nicotine as you possibly can. Um, that nicotine is going to reach the brain. Um, and once it does that, it's going to activate a pathway that tells your endothelial cells to produce nitric oxide. So not only did you get it from smoking, but now that nicotine is activating a pathway that's going to tell your body to produce more. Um, so even after that initial nitric oxide concentration from smoking it, now later on you're still causing vasodilation from the nicotine entering into your brain. Um, overall, this is going to reduce your vasodilation, it's going to reduce your stress. Um, it's one reason why smoking is so addictive because it's using that nitric oxide to actually allow you to take up more nicotine and get more of an effect from it. Um, and it's kind of a long-term effect, uh, relatively, because you're getting it initially, and then as that nicotine's reaching your brain, you're getting more and more. Um, like most things we see, like with heavy drug addiction, things like that, over time, chronic exposure to that nicotine um, is going to cause obviously chronic exposure to nitric oxide because you're getting more nitric oxide than you would under normal conditions. Um, and that's actually gonna reduce the amount of um, receptors you have for that nitric oxide, which is then gonna reduce your ability to dilate, causing uh, chronic hypertension. So if you have any of these things, you know, what do you, what do, you do? You know, you go to the doctor, you have hypertension, what are they gonna do for you? Um, there's a few different options. Um, of course, vasoconstriction is your primary problem. Um, too much of it's not good. Um, one option is an ACE inhibitor. ACE is um, angiotensin converting enzyme. That's an enzyme that's going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Um, now, if you take this drug, you're going to reduce your angiotensin 2 concentration. So you're going to reduce the activation of that pathway that causes that vasoconstriction. Um, a renin blocker, I kind of covered that um, with methyl dopa and pregnancy-induced hypertension. But a renin blocker is going to um, prevent angiotensin from ever being converted to angiotensin 1. Um, I'm going to talk more about it later, but that's actually a really important aspect um, that it's preventing the production of angiotensin 1. Um, another option is an angiotensin, angiotensin I'm sorry, receptor antagonist. Um, that's a drug that's, you know, of course, like any other antagonist, it's um, a, a drug that its ligand is similar in structure to angiotensin, and it's going to bind that receptor and prevent activation of that pathway. Um, I told you I was going to focus more, and here's why I do that, on a renin blocker. Um, of the available drugs that can give you for hypertension, a renin blocker has proved to be much more efficient. Um, I've set up this little bitty figure that I hope helps clear things up. This is kind of a really, really, really brief overview of that RAS pathway, um, uh, where angiotensin is going to be converted to angiotensin 1. Right in here is where renin is going to be working. Um, and then right here, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, here, angiotensin 2 
here's where your angiotensin converting enzyme, that ACE enzyme is going to be working. Um, and eventually that angiotensin is going to get down to the receptor of the smooth muscle cell. Um, the reason why renin blockers are so efficient is because there's actually something called the ACE escape phenomenon. And that's right here. There are actually um, enzymes in your liver, in your heart, in other parts of the body that can convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 um, without using angiotensin converting enzyme. Um, so just knocking this uh, ACE enzyme out here doesn't always mean you're preventing angiotensin 2 from being produced and uh, binding that receptor and causing vasoconstriction. Um, and so what a renin blocker does is if you cut off this pathway right here and you don't ever produce angiotensin 1, well, you don't have to worry about your ACE enzyme because if you don't have any 1, you don't have anything to use to make 2. Um, and so that's going to overall have a much more efficient effect of reducing um, your vasoconstriction. One of the common renin blockers they give is this alaskirin. Um, what alaskirin is, is a competitive um, inhibitor. Um, it's going to bind competitively to um, the renin enzyme. Um, a little bit hard to tell from this, um, but I used Rasmol to um, analyze this better because I feel like if you haven't used Rasmol, it's an amazing program. You should totally use it. Uh, Dr. Eisen loves it. I love it. Um, but basically what's going on here is here, uh, it's in, it's in ribbon form. Some of y'all that means something to some of you that means absolutely nothing. But, um, of course all the white is the actual ribbon protein. And then the blue is the drug. Now what this drug does when it binds is it blocks the catalytic residues of this ribbon. So this yellow and this red right here. These are actually aspartic acid residues, uh, specifically 32 and 215 of the renin protein. Now, this binds in here in a way that blocks those. Um, and so if you had angiotensin that wanted to come in, um, these two residues that are going to catalyze that reaction converting angiotensin to angiotensin 1 are going to be blocked by that drug. Um, to kind of show that a little better and make more sense of it, um, this is a space fill version of this. So you're seeing the same thing here, but in a different way. Again, the white is the renin protein, and then that alaskarin drug is this red. So if you see this little pocket, is the same pocket where angiotensin would kind of squeeze in there um, to be catalyzed by the two residues in here. Um, but what this drug does is it comes in here and binds, and now you've blocked that active site. You know, like we all have learned for years, that it's what inhibitors do. You've blocked that active site, so now you're not giving angiotensin um, access to those two aspartic acid residues that it needs to convert to angiotensin um, 1. Uh, just to kind of wrap this up and, and, and give a more blanket uh, explanation of what all this is, is that to avoid that ACE escape and to really give a solid, uh, confident, uh, solution to hypertension, renin blockers are actually a really, really good alternative to ACE inhibitors um, because you're cutting that pathway off at such an early point, you don't have to worry about any uh, uh, loopholes or anything that the cells are going to find to produce that angiotensin 2. Um, that's all I've got um, for this presentation. If there's any questions that anybody has, I'm sure Dr. Kelly is going to post my email address. Um, or if we're doing a Zoom, I'll be available that way. Uh, whatever it takes to answer any questions that you guys have. But other than that, that's, um, that's all I've got. Thanks.